So uh, I more or less finished with uh, the homomorphism portion of the lecture series. And so now I'll talk, start talking about quantum isomorphism. Uh, so I guess Laura also spoke about quantum isomorphism uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, so maybe some of you saw that. So the beginning part of this will be a, just a little bit of review, but probably some of you didn't uh, go to that talk. So uh, just very briefly, uh, well, let's make sure we know what an isomorphism is, right? So an isomorphism for graphs is just a bijection between the vertex sets uh, such that two, uh, two vertices are adjacent in, uh, in say G if and only if their images are adjacent uh, in H. So it preserves adjacency, but also non-adjacency. That's exactly what you expect, right? You're essentially just relabeling the vertices so that you go from one graph to the other. And we use this notation to denote the two graphs are isomorphic. Uh, and then you can also get this kind of nice uh, algebraic formulation in terms of the JC matrix. Um, two graphs are isomorphic if and only if you can find a permutation matrix P uh, that satisfies this equation, where these are the adjacency matrices. Now, maybe maybe you've seen seen it written like this. This is the more kind of natural way of writing it, right? Because this is sort of like, oh, I'm just uh, permuting the rows and columns of uh, a, a sub G in the same, uh, using the same permutation to get the adjacent matrix of H. Uh, but since it's a permutation matrix, we can move it over. And if you were in uh, Laura's talk yesterday, then you probably, you saw that uh, this allows you to sort of relax to uh, kind of a doubly stochastic matrices and get a new relation. Whereas uh, like it's, when, when you have doubly stochastic matrices, it's not the same as having like P transpose here, right? Uh, so that's isomorphism, but we want to think of that in terms of a game, just like we did with the homomorphism. Okay, and um, again, this is something that Laura went over, but uh, I'll review it. So it's the same setup, basic setup as the homomorphism game, right? You have some referee, you have your two players, Alice and Bob, they're cooperating. They're essentially trying to convince the referee that they know an isomorphism uh, from G to H, right? Um, one sort of main difference here is that in the GH homomorphism game, they were always sent vertices of G. In this game, they can be sent a vertex from either of the graphs. Okay, so Alice is getting sent some X sub A in response with Y sub A, and similarly, uh, Bob gets X sub B in response with Y sub B. And all four of those vertices are from um, the one of the two graphs. So, well, they can be, different ones can be from different graphs, right? So. Uh, we kind of we usually think that the graphs are uh, ver vertex is joint, uh, so that whenever you get a vertex, you know which graph it's from. But you could also just assume that they're sent the name of the graph and the vertex. Um, actually, if you're paying attention later on, you'll notice that I'll be talking about graphs that have some of the same vertices, but I'm just going to ignore that. Right. Um, the first condition for winning now is that if you get a vertex from G, you must respond with the vertex from H and vice versa. So you always have to respond with the vertex from the other graph. And what that means is that Alice is either gonna get or send back a vertex from G. And similarly, she's gonna either uh, send back or get a vertex from H, okay? So there's some G sub A that Alice either uh, guide or send back, and there's also some H sub A, and similar for Bob. And the, now, assuming they satisfy this condition, the second condition is that these vertices of G associated with Alice and Bob have to be related in the same way as the vertices from H. And by this, I mean, uh, if, they're, if the G vertices are equal, the H vertices must be equal. If the G vertices are adjacent, the H vertices must be adjacent. And if the G vertices are distinct and non-adjacent, then the H vertices have to be distinct and non-adjacent. G and H the same as X and Y, or are they somehow related? Uh, no, there's only a little X sub A. There's no big X. Right, but you're two changed from X's to Y's to G's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was saying if this condition is satisfied here, right, that means one of X A and Y A has to be from G. I'm going to call that G A. And one of X A and Y A has to be from H. I'm going to call that H sub A. Okay. And similar for, for the Bs. Yeah, no, that's a good word. Actually, in the quantum case, uh, if we wanted to, we could just assume that the graphs have the same size and then only give them questions from one of the graphs if we want it, but you get the same thing. But in, for the non sinking strategies, which I talked about yesterday, you really need this sort of like more uh, uh, expansive game. Um, all right. Uh, if you really want, you can allow loops on the graphs, and then you would also need an, an extra sort of uh, that if, if the graph, if the vertex is a loop, then the 
corresponding vertex from H needs to have a loop uh, that you can kind of ignore. Um, well, okay, you probably could guess that you can win this game with a classical strategy if and only if the graphs are isomorphic. And then we use that to define notions of quantum isomorphism. So the QT, quantum tensor isomorphic, if and only if there's a quantum tensor strategy. Similarly, the quantum commuting isomorphic, if and only if there's a quantum commuting strategy. And we just take that as the definition. Uh, but of course, uh, we're not happy with just making this definition. We want to get some nice reformulation, right? And we can get a nice reformulation very similar to this, but right? we're using the notion of quantum permutation matrices. And maybe Laura called them projective permutation matrices yesterday. I'm going to say quantum permutation matrices. I would use QPM for short. So, uh, and I also think she probably stuck to finite dimensional things. So here we'll be a bit more general. So a quantum permutation matrix, it's a matrix with entries from some C star algebra. Uh, if that makes you uncomfortable, then a C star algebra is, it's basically like matrices, but a little different. Right. Okay. So you can think of these entries of this matrix as being matrices themselves. Okay, and the P of quantum permutation matrix, you need that all of these entries are projections, right? So they square themselves and they're equal to their own adjoint. And then all of the rows and the columns in your matrix must sum to the identity uh, operator, uh, in, or the identity in your algebra. Okay, so that's a quantum permutation matrix. And maybe you can see that, okay, if this C star algebra were just the complex numbers, right? Then this first condition says that uh, all the entries are zero or one. And the second condition says there's exactly one, one in every row and every column, which means that you have a permutation matrix. So that's why we call it a quantum permutation matrix. And, and then the theorem is exactly what you expect to get. Uh, well, you get uh, the two graphs of quantum commuting isomorphic if or only if there exists a quantum permutation matrix uh, such that this equation holds uh, AG times P equals P times AH. Um, and by the way, assuming you have a quantum permutation matrix here for P, this equation is equivalent to these orthogonalities. So you need that P sub GH times P sub G prime H prime is zero whenever the relationship between the G vertices is not the same as the relationship between the H vertices. And then the QT isomorphic if and only if, the same thing, but now you need that your quantum permutation matrix has uh, is finite dimensional, by, by which I mean that the entries are just finite dimensional matrices. Okay. I, and I should probably point out that uh, this, I mean, this is using kind of similar type like things for when we had this reformulation for quantum homomorphism, going from the game to just these matrices. Um, this is also similar, but in this kind of more general setting, except for that using standard techniques, you would actually need that this quantum permutation matrices takes uh, has entries in some C star algebra that has a, something called a tracial state. And that's an extra condition, which is non trivial on the C star algebra. Uh, but, and then it actually does take some work to remove that requirement, but it's equivalent. So, but that uses some like quantum group theory stuff. I, I won't go into detail on that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's basically this short intro to uh, these uh, quantum isomorphism game, the quantum isomorphisms. Uh, the last thing I will say is that. Um, if I have two quantum isomorphic graphs, then all of these quantum parameters I was talking about before, they must be equal for the two graphs, right? Uh, in particular, if two graphs, two graphs are quantum isomorphic, if and only if their complements are quantum isomorphic, that's actually easy to see just from the game, right? Because, I mean, this sort of doesn't change taking complements, right? I just swap adjacency, non-adjacency. Um, so, and also, if I have a quantum, a quantum isomorphism is essentially a special case of a quantum homomorphism, but in both directions. So if I have a quantum isomorphism between two graphs, I have a quantum homomorphism in both directions between the graphs. So that means any of these quantum homomorphism monotone parameters must be equal for the two graphs, because I will have an inequality in both directions. And in practice, actually, for instance, like for this projective packing number, right, this, could sum, this was a su supremum, right? Uh, but you could be more specific and say, well, if G has a projective packing of this value, then H must also have a projective packing of this value. So you can be a little bit, uh, a little bit more specific. Okay, so that's uh, that's what I wanted to say to to get you up to speed. If you miss our talk, so if there's any questions about this, please let me know. Um, I mean, I know this was fairly quick, but we saw a very similar game before. Uh, and this is essentially what you expect to happen once you see the notion of quantum permutation matrix. So 
Um, hopefully you can uh, accept that. Um, now today, what we're really gonna talk about is how to find examples of graphs that are quantum isomorphic that aren't isomorphic, okay? And that's sort of, I think most, if not all of the things that Lars spoke about yesterday in her talk, we essentially knew even maybe for some time before we knew that quantum isomorphism was not just the same thing as isomorphism, right? So we kind of had proved a bunch of stuff about quantum isomorphism, but if it turns out it's the same thing as isomorphism, nobody's gonna care, right? Um, so that was kind of the hardest thing uh, about the, this first paper uh, we wrote. It was finding, uh, figuring out how to construct examples of quantum isomorphic graphs that are not isomorphic. Uh, and the construction that I will tell you about is, uh, well, it's not strictly speaking the only construction. Um, there's essentially one other that was uh, done by uh, Musto, Aroida, and Verdun from Oxford, and they could reconstruct some of the examples we had, but I, they could never manage to get any new examples. But very recently, um, actually, a postdoc of Lars, uh, Simone Schmidt, uh, used very similar ideas to what they did uh, and found a pair of strongly regular graphs that are quantum isomorphic um, on 120 vertices. So. Um, and it's somehow related to this root system E8. It's like the orthogonality graph of the root system for E8 is one of the graphs, and the other one is some other graph with the same parameters. Okay. Um, but that's not that's not uh, on archive even yet. So, right. Okay. So the, the construction is based on uh, linear systems over Z2, so uh, which we usually refer to as a binary linear system, um, or maybe BLS for short. Okay, but it's nothing complicated. Anyone who's done math would be familiar with something like this. So, I mean, I have some matrix M, uh, which is uh, M by N with entries from Z2. I never remember this. Okay, M, uh, so, and then you know, we consider MX equals B, right? Okay, this is just some linear equation, right? Uh, well, a bunch of linear equations, I suppose. Right? And X, of course, is a variable here, right? So. If we look at equation, maybe constraint L, right? What does it look like? It just looks like sum over I of M L I X I equals B L. Okay. Uh, but since these are all zero or one, okay, I can rewrite this um, as sum right, or sum over i in what I'll call s sub l of just x sub i equals b sub l. Okay, and this s sub l is just uh, the i in n such that uh, m l i equals one. Right, and I'm gonna keep using, by the way, I'll, I'll keep using this notation S sub L sort of throughout the whole talk today. So whenever I say S sub L, I, I'm always gonna mean, uh, for some matrix M is always gonna mean. Okay, so maybe let's look at an example. Well, I mean, do we really need an example? I mean, we all know what linear systems are, right? But let's look at a sort of interesting example or we, or we will become interesting later, I guess. Uh, and it's with six equations, but instead of just writing up the six equations, which would take me longer, then doing what I will do, I'll just, I'll write this nice little kind of a diagrammatic way. I'll have nine variables. Okay, and what I want is that all of my rows should sum up to zero. Okay, and then I want, let's say, two of my columns to sum up to zero and one of them to sum up to one. And now I ask you, does this have a solution? Bill is shaking his head no. So why, why does it have a solution? Yeah, you sum all the entries, if you sum, up, sum them up this way, I get zero plus zero plus zero, which is zero. And if I sum them up this way, I get zero plus zero plus one, which is one. Uh, so this has no solution. Uh, uh, and the reason I say it's interesting is because there's a, there's a sense in which it has a quantum solution. Um, now I will, I actually, I will maybe not define what a quantum solution is because uh, I might not have uh, time to do all the other stuff. But I, if I finish early, I can tell you exactly what a quantum solution is. 
but it's essentially like an operator valued solution to the system of equations. Okay, you need to convert it into a multiplicative form and then you relax these uh, plus or minus one variables to operator variables. Okay, but what we really want to do is we want to take these inner systems and build a game out of them. And this was done. Uh, so we'll call this, uh, this is going to be the MB game. Okay, and this was originally done by um, uh, Richard Cleave and Rajat uh, Mittal to find these games. Um, and then later it was also worked on by uh, Cleave, uh, Lou, and Slavstra. So some of the results we talked about that day will be from, from the from the first two authors and some from the second uh, second list of authors. Okay, so how does this work? I mean, it's again, it's the same basic setup as the isomorphs and the homomorphism game. You have some referee and you have your two players, Alice and Bob. Uh, but now uh, the questions they get in are different. It doesn't have to do with the graph anymore. So, um, so Alice uh, is sent just some index of one of the equations. And then what she's gonna do is she's gonna respond S sub L to Z2. Okay, and the intent is that this function should essentially be a solution to just that equation. Right? She doesn't have to somehow assign values to all of the variables in the system, but just to the variables in that, in that equation. Okay, and Bob, Bob, of course, is gonna do uh, the same thing. I'll call this FA. Right. And to win, you have to satisfy some conditions. Well, first of all, they, they need that actually these functions are solutions, right? Not every function will be a solution to that equation, right? So they need that if I sum over I in S sub L, F A I, this is equal to B sub L and the sum over I in S sub K, F sub B of I is equal to B sub K. Okay, so this says that Alice responds with something that actually is a partial solution uh, and, uh, and Bob, uh, Bob does the same thing. So this is sort of like the constraint satisfaction or uh, part of the uh, condi winning condition. Okay, but they also need, I mean, if you just said this, this would be, this would be easy because I mean, Alice and Bob don't have to agree on anything. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so I mean, in, unless somehow the equation I guess is trivial, where it's like zero equals one, <laughs> uh, then they can always do that. Okay. So the second condition is they must be consistent with each other. Okay. So if uh, there's some index uh, which is in both of those sets, uh, then they must satisfy that they agree, sort of on that variable assignment. And this, this makes sure that, that they really are agreeing on a solution. Okay. Uh, so one thing to point out is that, um, so this means that uh, if L equals K, so if they're given the same questions, then they actually have to give the exact same answer, right? Because they must agree on all the shared variables, right? Um, so that's the game. And well, okay, I'm not gonna, uh, I mean, you can all guess what happens in the classical case, right? So if you have a solution to this system, then you can win the game, of course, you just respond according to that solution. On the other hand, if you can win this game classically, uh, then you can, you can uh, find a solution to the system. Right? It's uh, not so hard to see that, right? I mean, they, if you assume that they're doing something deterministic in classical, then they just have some assignment to all the variables, right? Because they have, because of this agreeing condition. Okay. Um, can it be harder if you're learning the errors? It's hard if you have any, any fraction of, of, so you have an inconsistent system and you want to find, you want to find a solution that satisfies 90% of the equations. It's, it's, it's a standard problem. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know much about that. I, I think I've heard something about that, but I'm sure you know more than me. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay, but we only care about solving all of them, right? So winning, winning the game in every case. Um, all right, so that's a classical statement, right? You can win if and only if there's a solution, okay? And as I said, there is a notion of a quantum solution for such systems, okay? And then 
the statement is that uh, well, okay, the theorem uh, is that um, this has a well. I'll just write uh, exist uh, QC strategy if and only if uh, there is a quantum solution and there exists QT strategy. This is if and only if there exists uh, a finite dimensional. All right. So there is a quantum analog for the for the classical thing. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to relate this to uh, uh, to graph isomorphism, right? I mean, uh, that's our main point here. We want to find some way of constructing uh, quantum isomorphic and non-isomorphic graphs. But one reason to to look at uh, things like this is because it's there's known examples where there's a quantum solution but no classical solution. In particular, here is one example. I, maybe I should say this is known as the merman perez metric square. Okay, so we need to somehow get some graphs out of these linear systems. Okay, uh, and so that's what we'll do. We'll define for, for any such linear systems, some G of M comma B. And so what are the vertices? Essentially gonna be all of the, uh, all of the partial solutions to, to all of the equations, right? So I, if I look at every equation, I look at all the solutions just to that equation, Right, and each of those is going to give me a vertex. Okay, so th those are my uh, those are my vertices. Okay, and then two of these are going to be adjacent when so f is adjacent to f prime if there exists an i common to sort of the two corresponding equations. Um, I should say maybe. So if I have two of these, one for the lth equation and uh, one or the kth equation, then they're adjacent whenever they disagree on something. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, this definition of adjacency, what you might notice is that for a fixed L, right, all of the corresponding functions will be adjacent, right? Because they're different functions, right? So they will have to disagree on some variable, right? If they agreed on all the variables, then they'd be the same function, they'd be the same vertex, right? So that means that this graph, it's partitioned into uh, M cliques corresponding to the, the M equations. So in particular, it means I can color the complement with at most M colors. And now we have uh, a theorem. It's, okay, if I have M following our equivalent, G of M comma B, uh, oh no, sorry, I wanna have, uh, yeah. Mx equals B as a solution. Which one is it next? G. Okay. This is equivalent to the graph for M and B being isomorphic to the graph for the homogeneous system. So I just take the same uh, uh, the same equations, but I make the right hand side all zero. And this is equivalent to this graph, the independent number equal to M. And maybe I should point out that. Reminder: This is these are all equivalent, right? So this the system has a solution, which is the same as this game having a perfect strategy. Uh, this is equivalent to this graph being isomorphic to the homogeneous version, uh, which is equivalent to there being uh, well, it's equivalent to the independent sum of being equal to m, which is also in, uh, equivalent to there being an independent set of size m, right? Because I have partitioned my graph into m cliques, so I can't have Independence number bigger than M, right? So this is the same as finding an independent set. So I'm not going to go into detail about this proof, but it's it's uh it's actually not so difficult actually. Um, if I have a solution, then essentially what I can do is I, I fix the solution to this system, and now for every I look at each vertex in my graph G of M comma B, right? This is a solution just for one of the equations, and I essentially just add that solution to the sort of global solution I had, like just for that part. And that will give me another solution. Well, it will give me a solution for that equation, but now the homogeneous one, right? Because it was an equal zero equation, I had two solutions that equal zero, I add them up equal zero, or I have two solutions that when I add them up, I get one. So I add both of them together, I get zero again. So that will give me uh, a solution uh, that's for the homogeneous case, which will be a vertex over here. And that's the, that's the uh, isomorphism. 
if this is true, well, then they have the same independence number, okay? And actually, it's easy to see that an independent set of size M in these graphs is just a solution to your system because you have for, you have essentially selected for each equation a solution, and since it's an independent set, they have to all be um, they have to all be consistent. Right? So this definitely has independent set of size M, and if these are isomorphic, well, then this one has an independent set of size M, and if this has an independent set of size M, then we have a solution. But we want the quantum version. We want the quantum version. And of course, there's going to be actually two quantum versions, right? Because we have this QT and the QC um, strategies. Um, so, I mean, they're the same thing. They just, you just change T to C, right? Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll write down the one for, for QT just so we can stick with finite dimensional things because I'm going to go through, roughly go through the proof. Okay. So, so again, we have uh, some matrix M and vector B. And then we have the following R equivalent. Okay, one. So I will phrase it as uh, MB game a QT strategy. Okay, remember, this is the same as having a finite dimensional quantum solution to your system, but I haven't told you what that is. So let's stick with this. Um, this is equivalent to the graphs being QT isomorphic. And actually, we will have three, we'll kind of, uh, we'll have four things for the quantum one. Uh, just because that's the way the proof kind of naturally goes. But the next is, uh, so alpha QT, G of M comma B is equal to M. And then the last one is uh, the same thing, but instead of alpha QT, we have the protective packing number, this alpha P. Okay, and I want that it's equal, but also they actually, it's a, it's attained. So remember this dot over the equal sign mean that I actually attain that value with some protective packing. Okay, so that's, that's the theorem. I'm at 05. Okay, so I should be okay. Um, and we're going to kind of walk through it. Um, okay, so let's start with one implies two. And this we're going to do actually in terms of the game. Right, so essentially what I'm going to do here is I'm going to assume that I have a QT strategy for the MB game. And I'm just going to kind of use that as a black box to build a strategy for uh, the isomorphism game for these two graphs. We wanna play, we wanna play the isomorphism game. We assume we have a strategy here. So uh, Alice is gonna get some vertex. And uh, remember I said earlier, we can assume that they always get, if the graphs are the same size, we can assume they always get vertices from the, from the first graph, for instance, right? So I'm just gonna stick to that because it makes, the proof a little simpler. So let's assume that they're only given vertices from this graph. Of course, the proof goes the same. If you have a vertex from this graph, it just gets a little bit more like complicated to write down. Okay, so Alice gets some vertex uh, f sub a uh, from uh, from g of m comma b. So that means that when I sum uh, over the elements here, the value of the function, I get b sub l. Uh, and Bob some f sub b so what they do is they pretend they're playing the mb game this the linear system game where their inputs are l and k right so so play mb game with inputs l and k and what that gives them is it it gives them uh partial solutions to those equations so they get some f a prime uh, and F B prime. Okay, and now they have to use these to construct a response for the isomorphism game. Okay, so they were they were originally sent these vertices in the isomorphism game. They pretend that they're playing the linear system game with inputs L and K. Okay, and they get some outputs from the linear system game. Okay, and now they're going to use these to to compute uh, their uh, their responses for the isomorphism game, and it's just going to be the sum of the, the functions. Okay, so Alice is gonna respond with FA plus FA prime and Bob responds with FB plus FB prime. And this sum, it just means sort of, you know, uh, coordinate wise. So, well, we need to make sure that this is actually a valid strategy. Okay, the first thing we need is that these are actually vertices uh, in this graph. But remember, F sub A, this was the vertex from this graph. So that means it was a solution to the Lth equation, 
Also, this is a solution to the elk equation because it came from the, the linear system game. Okay. So now when I add two solutions, I, again, I will get a homogeneous, a solution to the homogeneous equation, right? And so that's the vertex here, similarly for Bob. Okay, so that's good. Uh, now I need to check that um, if the inputs were adjacent, then the outputs will be adjacent and similar for non-adjacent. Let's just do adjacent, it's the same basically for... So let's suppose that uh, FA, it's adjacent to FB, right? That means there's, uh, there's some I, SL intersect SK, uh, such that they disagree. The FA prime and the FB prime, they have to agree on any shared variables, right? That was one of the conditions for this linear system game, right? So if these two disagree on I, but these two agree on I, Right? then their sum is going to disagree. So that means that the outcomes, they disagree on this variable, which means that uh, the vertices they output are adjacent, which is what we wanted. And the non-adjacency is, is the same central argument. Okay, so that's, that shows that one implies two. Um, so now let's go back to the other boards. So now we want to do uh, two implies three, but this is actually essentially trivial. So for two implies three, we assume that the graphs are quantum isomorphic, but then of course this means that the quantum independence numbers are the same, right? So I know that this alpha QT of G of M B is equal to alpha QT of the homogeneous graph. We, we already said before, the independence number of this graph, like the classical independence number is M. So certainly the quantum independence number is at least M, right? But it actually, it can't be more than M, right? Because the graph partitions into those M cliques, which means I can color the complement with M colors and the chromatic number of the complement is an upper bound on the quantum independence number. Remember we, uh, we saw alpha QT, this is less than or equal to theta, which is less, I should need to put the graphs in there. This is less than or equal to low S theta, which is let, which is a lower bound on the chromatic number of the complement. Okay, so this implies that uh, well, this is equal to n. So this is sort of trivial. Uh, well, the next one is also trivial. If alpha QT is equal to m, alpha p, then there is a projective packing of value m. Right, but I can't be higher again. I can't be higher than that because alpha p is also upper bounded by this theta, and therefore by uh, chi of g bar. Right, so here we go. Okay, and now the sort of the challenging one, actually the hardest part, I would say, uh, is going four to one. Okay, I'm not going to go through the full details of this part, um, but what you should note is that remember the proof for uh, for one to two. Right? We assumed we had a, a strategy for uh, the linear system game, okay? And we use that to build a strategy for the isomorphism game. What we would like to do is we would like to be able to just go back the other way. Uh, and if you sort of look at the construction, uh, you could imagine that you almost, you almost can somehow. I mean, suppose I wanna play this game. Right, so I'm given an equation uh, in this system. What I could do is I could just pick arbitrarily some vertex from this graph that corresponds to that equation. Doesn't matter which one, okay? And then I assume I have a strategy here, so I get some vertex over here. If I, my strategy is such that I, all, I sort of preserve the equation that these vertices correspond to, right? If whenever I have a vertex from equation L here, I output a vertex from equation L here, I can do this sum thing again. And like Oprah said too, this sum essentially is uh, its own inverse, right? So you can essentially just reverse this argument, assuming you had some strategy that whenever I put in a vertex from the, uh, that corresponding to the Lth equation here, I get a vertex corresponding to the Lth equation here. Okay. So the classical case, you try to separate the graphs. You decorate the graph so the isomorphism is forced in that L. Yeah, yeah. You color the vertices. Yeah. Made, like, you could add colors to the game if you like. 
right? If you want to be lazy and not actually have to come up with gadgets, right? Yeah. You, you just add colors to the isomorphism game and say you have to reserve your colors. Right. Right. But here it could be that equate that they set of solutions to equation one get mapped to the solutions. Yeah, I mean that is possible. Even in the classical case, there could be there could be other isomorphisms between those two graphs. But the cliques are so big. Cliques get mapped to the cliques. The cliques we map the cliques. Okay. Right? But they could be like, for instance, for this uh, for this one, right? You get six cliques of size four partitions back. But those that partition uh, partition preserved. Uh, no, I should be careful. I don't know for sure that partition preserved. Okay, but those cliques can be mapped to, mapped around. I mean, the, the graphs are vertex transitive, so you can just use an automorphism. You've used the natural isomorphism, and then you can use an automorphism to map a vertex to any other vertex you want, right? So it definitely doesn't, in general, it doesn't have to preserve uh, those cliques, but there, there will be one, okay? Uh, so we're going to use the fact, so how am I on time, actually? I, I got 13 minutes. Yeah, sorry for moving back and forth. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to use okay. We get uh, we have we, we have four right. So we have that there is a projective packing of value m, right? Well, but I know for each of those cliques, if I look at the projective packing in each of those cliques, right, the projections they add up to something which is a projection sort of bounded by identity, right? Um, so that, but that means that since I actually end up with value M, I actually have to be equal to identity on all the cliques, right? Um, so because, so if I sum over a clique, sum over um, these, these vertices, let's say my projective backing is some E sub F, okay? Um, then this is gonna, has to be, uh, less than or equal to identity, okay? In particular, then the rank is less than or equal to D. So when I sum over all the vertices, I get that the, the total rank is less than or equal to M times D, right? But I need that it's actually equal to M times D in order to get a value of M, right? Because remember, I divide by D, right? So that means I must have a quality everywhere here, right? But if I have that the sum of the ranks of these projections, uh, which must be mutually orthogonal, is equal to D, that must mean that their sum is equal to the identity. Okay? So actually, I get that on all of these cliques, I have some projections assigned that sum up to the identity. So I have, I have, some, uh, I have some projective packing E sub F. Okay? And then I define uh, uh, projection P of uh, F comma F prime, this is going to be equal to, uh, well, it's going to be zero. Uh, so I should say F is from SL to Z2, F prime, SK to Z2. So this would be zero if L is not equal to K. Uh, and otherwise, it's going to be equal to uh, E of just the sum. So actually, I should point out, so this is going to be a vertex from uh, G of MB. This is going to be a vertex from G of M0, right? So their sum will be a solution for the non-homogeneous case, right? So that, will, that means this will be a vertex in G of MB, right? Because I'm taking a, not, a solution for the non-homogeneous system plus a solution for the homogeneous system. So that gives me a solution for the non-homogeneous non one. And so that means I can set this equal to the value of whatever the projective packing on that vertex was. Okay, and then you just have to check that this gives you a quantum permutation matrix and that this quantum permutation matrix uh, satisfies the orthogonalities that you need uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, quantum isomorphism. And then this will correspond now to a strategy where you will preserve uh, what equation the vertex corresponds to because sort of this being zero when L is not equal to K, that corresponds to the fact that you never output a vertex associated to the Kth equation whenever you're given a vertex associated to the Lth equation, okay? So that's a very rough sketch of, of, of that part. I know it was very, it was a bit hand wavy, but that's, that's the essential idea. Okay? And of course you can do it all in terms of matrices if you like. Uh, it's fairly intuitive in terms of the game, I think. 
Okay. Um, okay. So I've shown you that if I have a linear system game or a linear system such that this game has a quantum, a QT strategy or, or a QC strategy, whatever I like, with no classical strategy, then I'll get a pair of quantum isomorphic graphs that are not isomorphic. I and mean, that's what we wanted. But we still need to know how to find linear systems that have a quantum solution, but no classical solution, right? Otherwise, I haven't done anything useful. Okay, but luckily, uh, this is, well, more recently, Slofstra has sort of characterized this uh, in terms of group theory. Uh, but an earlier work by Arkhipov uh, gives some really nice examples, uh, which are actually based on graphs. So we start actually, we're going to be starting with a graph, building linear systems, and then taking linear systems and building graphs. Okay. All right. So we're going to take M to be the incidence matrix of a graph. So incidence matrix, uh, that means that the uh, for me, it means the rows are indexed by the vertices and the columns by the edges, right? And then we have a one uh, in an entry if that vertex and edge are incident to each other. Okay, and then uh, B is some vector indexed by the vertices of G uh, with odd parity. So by that, I mean... Uh, it has an odd number of ones in it. Okay, and then what Archibar proved is that um, mx equals b has no classical solution. Actually, easy to see because a solution, it would correspond to a set of edges that gives you a graph that has an odd number of vertices of odd degree. And we all know that can't happen. Okay. But it has a QT slash QC solution. They, either it has both or neither. If and only if G is non-planar. Okay. So if and only if G is non-planar. Okay, and thankfully there are connected non-planar graphs. So now we can build these systems uh, and, uh, and we can build these graphs that are quantum isomorphic but not isomorphic. This is from K33. Okay. Um, and this also corresponds to the two graphs on 24 vertices that Laura showed you in her talk uh, yesterday. I'm not gonna draw them, that would be impossible for me. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so I can describe them because they're actually really nice Cayley graphs. Um, so they're Cayley graphs for the symmetric group on four elements. Uh, that's why they have 24 vertices. And the connection set, so the edges within these cliques corresponding to the equations, uh, those correspond to what I would call the double transpositions. So like something where you transpose two elements and transpose the other two elements among uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, and then the other edges in one of the graphs are the transpositions, and then the other graph are the four cycles. So essentially what this quantum isomorphism is doing is it's somehow taking the transpositions to the four cycles and this uh, permutation. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. I, I, just, I think you've said it, but I just wanted to ask, what, what the smallest uh, example of, of quantum isomorphic graphs that aren't isomorphic? Uh, well, the smallest we know of are these 24 vertices. 24 graphs. vertices, okay. Is there a lower bound on the number of vertices for? Okay. I. I think that we know that uh, you need at least like 15 or 16 vertices. And this is based on like coherent algebra stuff. Um, but yeah, so then I guess there's a range of like eight or nine vertices or something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I expect to be the answer. These could be the smallest. That wouldn't be that surprising, but I also wouldn't be so surprised if there was a smaller pair. Infinite family here, right? Because there are infinitely many. Yeah, of course there are infinitely many. I mean, in a certain sense, I mean, okay, if you look at the proof of this, mm -hmm. uh, in a certain sense, there's just two because the sort of the you can always use the solutions for K33 and K5 uh, for an, uh, to to give you a solution for the sort of arbitrary uh, oh. non-planar graph. Uh, but that's not really completely true because I mean, some of them have some properties that some other ones don't have. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's an infinite family, but of course, uh, there are more. These are not the only systems. 
uh, that have uh, have this property, right? And like I said, Slavka has given this characterization in terms of this thing called the solution group, which you associate to the linear system, right? And and then it's just sort of it has a quantum solution if and only if uh, a certain element is not the identity in this uh, finitely generated group. Okay. Mm -hmm. If there are no more questions, let's thank David again. Mm -hmm.